details of our fourth R program as part of the workshop. What I'm going to do today is talk about the adolescent developmental issues, things that often get overlooked. People think, um, well, let's just develop a program for teens or for dating violence and this kind of thing, and they forget about what teens are going through and what, the, the, what we know about their development and what they need as a function of that, because we have lots of rich information about child and adolescent development. <clears throat> the translation of it into programming um, is not well done. And as many of you heard this morning, I say that many times, uh, I'm a prevention person. I believe it's easier to prevent a lot of these issues than to try to treat the consequences. We don't do nearly enough about it. So I'm, uh, the purpose here is to look at op opportunities in the course of adolescent development where you could educate them, give them new information and, and skills so that they get through these um, stages that they have to go through relatively unscathed. And whether you're a parent, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a researcher, psychologist, and so forth, everyone needs to understand these things so they can help kids cope and adapt and feel uh, successful at these different stages. <clears throat> One of the things I want to get out of the way right away is uh, everyone thinks that uh, Canada is, has no gangs, has no violence. If you watch Michael Moore movies, you know, he, he, he shows sort of the, the good side of Canada and Windsor and Toronto. We do have gangs. In fact, I, I, uh, I came across this recent photo of a Canadian street gang that I thought you'd find very entertaining. <clears throat> <laughs> Got to love it, huh? This is, our, this is the extent of our street gangs in Canada. Not true. Actually, Toronto has violence, as many big cities do, and we're wrestling with that. Uh, I don't live in Toronto because of their mayor there. I refuse to actually go near the city. But <laughs> I live two hours west of there in the town of London. Uh, Asia, I'll correct one little thing. I, work, I, work, I now work for the University of Toronto. Western, I left 10 years ago, but I still work on the Western campus. It's very confusing. I just refused to live in Toronto. I said, sure, I'll take your chair, but I'm going to work here. So that's what I do. Um, the reason for that is the work I do, I'm fortunate enough to do it with school boards and so forth. I have a team of educators that work with me um, so that we're able to do prevention. We do it in the schools because that's where the kids are. And uh, we have to do it in a way that blends with what the, the schools are able to teach and that. So with that in mind, what we're going to look at today it's really the common elements of violence and abuse in relationships, not just in adolescence, but the, what we really know after 30-some years of research about these topics, violence and abuse. I'm not going to isolate it to just teen dating violence or sexual assaults. I'm going to look at it from a broader perspective of violence and relationships. And the reason I say preventing it in the next generation is that, unfortunately, the way we have approached violence has been uh, as if it can be cured by a quick and dirty strategy, just tell the kids not to do it in that. Very superficial, never ingrained in our education, both in here, I don't know hardly any countries that do, so it's all kind of new. We always pull our hair out and say, why are kids so abusive and violent and so forth? And you have to turn around and, and say, it's because the society that they live in, what we have created for them. It's not because they're bad kids. So we look at the whole element here, the whole kid, within the context of their peer culture and society. And I try to look at abuse and violence really from childhood abuse where I cut my teeth years ago and that's what I was working on to teen dating violence that I work on today. The reason I told everyone else earlier that I work on teen dating violence is it is a great vehicle at which to get people engaged at that age in reversing some of the bad patterns they may have grown up with. That's how I started. You don't have to be like your parents because I worked with abused, abused kids. And that led to, you don't have to be like anyone older than you. You can form your own healthy relationships and understand this and not, not use violence in your relationships. Okay. <clears throat> the key principles of violence in relationships, it's a relationship problem. And everyone forgets about that. Abuse, we're not talking about street assaults and other types of, of severe forms of violence. We're talking about common, everyday violence. Whoop. I keep doing that. Common forms of violence, the everyday stuff that you hear a lot about only recently used to be under the, under the radar entirely. And it's uh, more common than we like to admit. And it's, it's a relationship problem because it occurs in the context of a relationship. Not to steal something from the other person, 
um, not to gain any, any advantage in that sense. It's about dealing with the conflict and relationship that people don't know how to deal with. And most of these causes stem from childhood. We're going to find out in a minute. <clears throat> Violence doesn't affect everyone equally. It doesn't affect everyone equally because people that have more social disadvantage in their communities are affected more by violence. We have to uh, start with that premise in mind. Okay? I grew up in a, in a fairly privileged environment in the United States, in St. Louis, in Connecticut, and ended up in Canada. So I can't say that my kids and the, the uh, situations that they grew up with today in Canada are the same that other kids that are immigrant children and so forth might face. They have much more stress and there's a lot more inequality. Recognize violence relationships as part of societal violence. And this is, again, part of the key aspects here that we're not trying to find the violent people. Forget that. 30 years ago when I was working with child abuse of parents, I was saying to people, there isn't a particular child abuse of parents. Like um, Dan, uh, Don Meichenbaum said when he was at Waterloo, I think it's around here some, somewhere in Miami now, right? I remember him saying, uh, sometimes it's amazing, I think, that that uh, any parent isn't abusive, because he had five kids. And everyone lives within the cloud of, of losing it at times. And that's why we recognize there isn't a them and a there. It's not a, it's not a categorical, you're violent and you're not. When we start with that premise, <clears throat> we recognize that um, abuse and violence is part of the strategies that we see around us and grow up with, and we have to start to reverse. And because the strategies in place for the last 30 years are not working, their strategies have always been, and they still are, find the ones that are doing this and stop them. You know, just prevent them from getting in the school, catch them with, uh, with the weapons that they might bring to school, punish them, kick them out of school, and on and on I go. Um, but it's never about t teaching them how to cope and, and deal with the environment that we have left for them. Um, sometimes you do have to kick kids out of school. I'm not saying that's impossible, but. A violence prevention and safe school program shouldn't be bigger fences and more cameras. That's, but that's what they typically are. Uh, <clears throat> relationships are dynamic and can be adjusted along the lifespan. Again, a very important concept because um, the kids are learning about relationships. Relationships carry forward. So what you learn as a young child carries forward to the next stage of your relationships. An example of that is a little kid that uh, learns to relate with mom and dad in a certain way, if mom happens to be physically mean or abusive or maybe depressed and not, not available, when that child enters into kindergarten in grade one, uh, he or she may expect women to be like that. They generalize very quickly and they be, may be anxious and expect someone else to treat them that way. How they learn to deal with relationships, if they have especially positive examples, they're going to carry that forward. It becomes intrinsic. This is who I am. We call it self in relationships. Who you are is who you relate to, how you relate to people. Very fundamental. So those early building blocks are certainly important, but they can be adjusted. And for many, many, many years, we always thought, well, adolescents, you know, let's just close our eyes and hold our breath and hope to get to 1920. That's the way we dealt with adolescents. And then increase the laws. You know, instead of delinquents, we call them young offenders and change some of the wording but it's always about doing something to them to, st to keep them from doing bad kids and never helping them. And yet, adolescence is a window of opportunity, age 12, 13, 14, 15. They're looking for guidance. They need it. And their peer group is the one that's been giving it to them, not uh, adults. So they can change. Kids that grew up in abusive, violent homes, witnessing violence, being the victim of violence, and so forth, um, can adjust that. And adolescence is a time to adjust it because they're looking to be something different. That's their job, is to try on a new, a new look, be someone different. And who are they going to be? You know, they're going to be someone that they, that they identify with and mentor, that mentors them or that they, that they look up to. And hopefully that's a good thing, whoever that person is. So that's important to remember. Healthy relationships are the most protective known in preventing violence. So. You, you're not going to be an abuser and a, and a violent person if you understand and, and know how to develop healthy relationships. Because abuse and violence has no place in a healthy relationship. So the way to counteract abuse is to help kids learn how to relate to one another without it, and to know what they're looking for, how to, how, what the expectations are. 
<clears throat> Why violence should, prevention should be universally available. So this is all about how kids learn to relate. Um, so how many of you are developmental people in here? If you have, great, okay, excellent. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, because that's not my background, but I've grown very, very uh, attracted to developmental research over the years. Learning to relate starts early. It's gender-based and requires positive influences. Fundamental principle again. So why is this important? Well, if we're going to build any stuff for adolescents, we have to know how they've learned to relate up until then and how we're going to adjust it. And let's look at for a minute how boys and girls learn to relate. If you're a boy and a girl growing up in today's society, and I can't, get, I can't cover every possible thing, but these are some of the fundamental developmental aspects we have to look at. The first is gender roles. Developmental psychology tells us that the, one of the first ways kids learn to relate to others is by gender. I'm a boy, therefore boys do these things. That's a natural thing in many ways. It's, there's nothing wrong with it. And the reason it happens that way, they say, is because in order to learn about big, bad, ugly things, big confusing things, you have to break them down into simple things, okay? So you're two, you're three years old, you're trying to figure out um, who do I talk to if I want something, how do I avoid punishment, and what do boys do, do and what do girls do, and they end up being kind of stratified, very rigid. Can a, can a, if you ask a three or four year old, can a girl be a doctor? At least 20 years ago, not today, but 20 years ago, no, girls are nurses, because that's what they had experienced, right? Very rigid and understandable, and that's why we strove to break down those barriers. But that's the way they look at it, right? And it helps them break, you know, the world down, and that's important. Keep that in mind, by, by being very gender rigid, okay? And then <clears throat> they learn to relate. As they grow a little older, grades five, or ages five, six, seven, eight, their gender-based ways of playing are very important to them. So boys learn to play with other boys. Girls learn to play with other girls primarily. They don't cross-play very much. And what kind of games do they play? Well, boys play games based on status, and girls play games and learn to relate based on connection. I'm not making this up. This is all in the literature, different words for it. Um, and again, an important aspect when we're talking about adolescents, let's understand where they're coming from, okay? So if you're a boy, because you like status games, you're playing with, let's say, two or three of your friends are playing. You're gonna play a game where, you know, you're the chief, you're, you're the boss, or, you know, whatever, and I, I give you authority to be these other things. And then another boy comes along, okay? And he says, hey, I wanna play, and I, you know, I wanna be the boss for a while. <laughs> no, you gotta earn uh, your way up. You're not gonna trample me. And their, their nature of games is very stratified and, 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 and it's like a tower. Someone has to be at the top. Girls, I can't explain why, but there's a lot of reasons they say, but girls tend to play games that are more um, on, a, on a horizontal plane where there's more connection. And I'm not saying one's better than the other, although there's a lot more girls in here than, than guys, <laughs> women. Um, <clears throat> so. They learn to play games where if you come along and uh, your little brother comes along and you're eight years old and he wants to play with you, you can play, but you gotta play what I say to play, but I have a role for you. And so he can, you know, he plays as long as he plays by their rules, okay? And it's connection. We want more people playing, but we want them to get along and play the way our games are played. Okay, now you're 12 and you wanna, you're, kinda, you're nine, you're 10, you wanna learn to play with the girls. Hey, your boy, and how do you do the cross play? How do you approach them? Because I'm used to, you know, the status thing. I, I, I got to, so I show off. Hey, look what I can do, you know, and then smash a bike into a wall or something. You do crazy things to get the girl's attention. And the girl's are like, Phew, you know. And then you start doing sexual stuff, a lot of the boys, because they think that's a way to get their attention. They pull the bra strap, they tease them about their development, whether it's too fast or too slow and they don't know how to do it. They don't know how to step over and, and they're attracted, they want the attention and vice versa. We could go on and on about it, but you get the point that in elementary school, this is all being shaped in terms of how we do it, how we cross play 
in what we do. <clears throat> and then we, the way to cross over into the other gender world is through expressions of teasing and minor forms of harassment, typically. Teasing, you tease a girl, boy, and girls tease back. Um, and that's a way of, of entering their world and trying to, to relate to them. Okay? And because they don't know how else to do it at that point. And some of that's, of course, all normative and, and acceptable. And then some of the sexual harassment stuff. According to the research that Pepler did in Toronto, um, har sexual harassment starts in grades four and, cont and then grows. And by the grades seven and eight, it's full blossomed. Okay? And I, you heard the joke this morning I said about my son and sexual harassment. They don't really know what it is, <clears throat> but it's, uh, it's certainly in full blossom by then. It starts off by poking fun at your development and, and anything different. Because here's the thing. In order for kids to learn how to, to relate to other people in a confusing world, a gender world, a peer world, you have to simplify things. And the best way to do it is girls are like this and guys are like that, black and white. And guess what? That was what it was like when you were three. Because now you're entering, as you now enter into middle school or grades you know, seven and eight, and the peer culture and pop culture is so critical and big, and it's very confusing. The best way to learn to relate is to break it down again, they say, so that it's very simple. You know? So I stay on the male side of the border, then everyone knows who I am, and I'm, and I'm not crossing over. And the girls are attracted to that, and same for the girls. I've got to stay on the girls' side of the border. Okay? Very careful about all that. The costs and benefits of learning to relate like this, in the Psych Bulletin Review article back in 06, um, I have to summarize it in a couple quick points, but there was a lot more beauty in the article, reviewing you know, tons of studies about learning to relate. <clears throat> there are costs associated with status versus connection for boys and for girls. Again, not necessarily better or worse, but let's know what they are. What are they for girls? Because they are into connection and basically more available to others. They're worried about relationships. They're worried about popularity. They have more emotional problems. So anxiety and depression and worry and so forth um, is well established in literature. And, but their behavior problems are less. They don't act out as much. They're not as much of a troublemaker because that's not how they've learned to relate. Okay? These things, these behavior problems don't just come out of you know, our genes and DNA. They are very much shaped by how we learn to relate. And the boys, guess what? <laughs> just the opposite. They've learned to relate by not caring about what other people feel. It's important that I have status. Remind you of any men you might know? Sometimes it does. But status is very important. Um, it's not necessarily bad status. I'm not saying it's anything wrong with it. It's just that that's how I learned to relate. And so I don't feel bad about that. I don't really have the anxiety and worry. You know, wh wh why, do we, why do you worry about these things? But if, if I can't get my status, then I'm, you know, I might hit you. I might call you names or bully you or something else. So you know, boys' behavior problems increase. And according to this <clears throat> nice review article, they, have, they, they build... They show you all the literature supporting the simple conclusion as to why girls have more emotional problems and where it, how it comes from learning to relate. So all this stuff to me is, in, is critical in understanding how we're going to stop violence in relationships. And then you add the burden of child maltreatment and interpersonal violence that they grow up with, and, and you've got a kid who's struggled or maybe learned to relate, and the consequences for certain relationships for that particular kid with maltreatment are different for us. They have to learn to relate by either avoiding relationships because they're dangerous, or if you can't beat them, join them. So they look at the world, as we like to say, as victims and victimizers. If you've grown up um, learning to relate in a world of child abuse, okay? to survive and cope and adjust, you have to learn to relate by either being a victim or a victimizer. And boys, in particular, will take the victimizer role because it's a better outcome for them. I have more status. Um, I understand it better. And most often, it's their dad that's the abuser. So they say, that's what, that's what guys do. So you get the picture here. Abuse and relationships, I know you all know this, but um, it doesn't come out of thin air. 
and we, we can't change it in thin air by just simply saying don't do it and punish them. They have to learn to relate differently and they have to feel good about it and understand what the goals are in doing it. Why do I give up this victim victimizer view of the world? You know, how many kids that are, that are the toughest kids look at the world in that black and white victim victimizer? You know, if I'm, if, I, if I'm not with them, then I'm the weak guy and I get picked on. So they've got to find ways to come out of that world. Now let's make the connections, why adolescence is key for change. <clears throat> let's look at maltreatment, bullying, gender-based harassment, adolescent dating violence. These things are cut from the same piece of cloth, my friends. Um, so I want you to think in your mind just to, you know, how valuable is it to have a program that addresses one of these? You gotta address them all. But you address them all from the roots, not from the flower and the seeds. You dress them from the roots that we're talking about in terms of relationships. People do these things because they don't know how to do other things. They don't have the exposure to it and so forth. So now we're going to get to the nature of adolescence a little bit deeper. So now you're in grade seven or eight. You've learned to relate, maybe healthy or unhealthy, but sexual harassment kind of has creeped in there because that's how you, you know how to, you think you know how to relate to other people. And we call patrolling the gender borders because you have to be very careful about crossing over if you're a guy or a girl. Um, it's okay to date girls and vice versa, but it's not okay in their peer world to be a friend of a girl necessarily unless you have you know, strong abilities, can know how to live in their world and not maintain the guy world. Remember, you're being scrutinized and watched every day by your peers, especially the guys. To this day, as it was in the 50s, um, status from young men comes mostly from sports. So you know if you're, the, if you're on the football team, you've got status, you've got the team behind you, and you're, you've got the, the, the guy stuff that's required. And that always remains when you rank it today in studies, um, sports for men is, is number one in terms of importance for their view for their sense of self, and that's because it sends to the, a message to the world that I'm 100% guy. There's no gay in me. Remember, they're all worried about that. The feminism, they can't cross that, or the uh, just being considered feminine at all, uh, can't cross that line. It's dangerous line. And this is the point where they're looking at <clears throat> autonomy, autonomy, transition, and experimentation, which I mentioned earlier. They are emerging from their family unit and they're trying to live outside of that which they have to learn to do. And that peer culture is very, very difficult. We watched a little clip about the stuff this morning around uh, what, what it's like today. It's very rapid. They're immersed in technology and electronic stuff. And it's a swirl. To make it simple, to figure out how to get along, to deal with that swirl, what do you do? You make sure that if you're a girl, you're not seen as anything guy-like and vice versa. Patrol that border. Um, the guys will patrol it violently. So if you're at a party and you're 15 years old, and yesterday or a couple days ago you made a comment in class um, about some guys who just think they're too macho or whatever it might be, you can get beat up at this party because you crossed the border. You didn't act like one of us. It's very important for them. This experimentation is, start, is, is coming on board now full strength. They're supposed to experiment. That's part of their job. It's keeping them safe as part of our job. And um, if we don't do anything, then they will could be caught up in the swirl. And they'll experiment with all this pornography, uh, sexual assaults, abusive drinking. You know, where does it end? So, of course, they have to have limits on them. They have to have education around it. There's pressure to conform, as I mentioned, that they have to fit in. The, the odd, the, kind of the funny thing here is that it's very important that you look really unique from your sisters and brothers that might be older or your, par you know, your parents. And you have to, of course, reject all that. I'm my own peer group. This is me. I've got I to gotta really be different. And then, of course, you have to be exactly like the other kids, <laughs> you know, exact same shoes and exact same look, or, um, but it's different than someone else. So, you know, we still have those groups of kids that dress certain ways in the high school and that because it's, it's sending a message. 
but there's pressure to conform and at the same time to, to be uh, autonomous. And then the, there's the borders are full of the gay baiting and the homophobia and pure violence. This is the world they live in. Yeah, you know, you forget what it's like. Some of you can remember better than others, but every day you're living in a world of, um, you know, immature minds who think it's really funny to do abusive and, and sexually driven things to other people and take pictures of it and circulate it and all this kind of stuff. So that's the world they're living in unless we help them um, work with each other to slow that down. Gay baiting and homophobia stuff are still rampant in the school. It's still considered. A lot of them don't really, it's not necessarily anti-gay. It's, that it's anti, um, what they're trying to say is you're not fitting my image of what a guy should be like. So therefore you must be gay because I don't really know gay is, but it must be guys, guys that you know, aren't guys. So they don't really understand it yet. They just know that you don't want to be called that because then you're outside your line and the people will bring you back in by beating you up. <clears throat> Signaling intimacy, of course, for girls in particular, they confuse abuse as signs of love and caring because they want to connect. They want this guy to stay their friend at least, but especially to love them and care for them. That's what they've been trained, so to speak, in terms of their relationships. I want, to, I want you to part of my life. And the guy is caught between wanting maybe to, to do that, but not being seen by his male friends, is being you know, too connected to the girl, like being controlled by her. So um, very tough time in their life, and they don't have enough help in getting through these things. Then you've got the peer culture and <clears throat> school connectedness. Um, striving for adult social roles. These are all the things, these are their jobs, right? They have to connect with their school, they have to achieve, they have to have adult roles, and they have to have a self-identity. Okay. So now I want to make sure that we talk about something we didn't talk about this morning or this afternoon, is the role of media and entertainment in promoting violence. Um, we can't stop Madison Avenue in Hollywood. Uh, they're very good at it. But I want to just show you a clip of, of the, the sewer that some of the kids are living in today and ask yourself whether this is healthy. It's just something they watch, no big deal. Back in the 70s, um, research was done in terms of TV violence and viewing. And uh, APA, our association, you know, said, you know, there's enough evidence after decades of following these people to show that there's a connection between how much violent TV you watch and, and, and violent acts. And then there's been a lot of controversy in the last 20 years about it. Now the data are in, and it's, it's stronger than ever in terms of these connections. Um, the association, association between media violence and aggressive behavior, according to this article in Pediatrics, based on 2,000 studies, is the same, is comparable to calcium intake and bone mass in terms of that relationship. Lead ingestion and lower IQ, no one, can, no one debates that. Condom use and HIV, no one debates that, smoking and lung cancer. Okay. So I ask, you know, I always bring this up because we're talking about adolescents. It's adolescents that live in this world. Most of the media violence is aimed at them and, and young men in their 20s. Um, and it's not the, the media violence per se. Everyone, you know, we all have a right to produce it as long as it doesn't degrade or abuse other people, I guess. The question is, there are no limits, and it's getting a lot worse. And <clears throat> because of adolescent development, where they're trying to fit in, they're trying to figure out, what am I supposed to do as a male? This stuff is almost poisonous. It's toxic. It is toxic. I'm an advocate for that. Other people say, you know, I am overblown, and I sound like a, a guy in the 50s saying Elvis Presley shakes his leg too much. It's, uh, it's there's evidence. I mean, this is... No one debates smoking and, and so forth. And yet, we don't know what to do about it. So I'm going to show you a clip about it. But it, you know, we don't really know what to do. We're like, uh, oh, abhorred and so forth. As parents, though, there's lots we can do about it. You can restrict and limit this. As educators, there's a lot we can do about it, about getting kids to talk about what they are attracted to, what's too much, what are the themes, how it's produced. All these things are produced with one thing in mind and one thing only, and that's to make money. And as soon as you tell adolescents that, they don't like to be manipulated. We didn't, and they don't. 
and it's all about money. I, I make more money if I have more graphic sex and more graphic violence. And now you can crank it up. You can have the low violent setting, and you can have a high blood spurt setting in your games. And I remember 20 years ago when our, my niece was living with us, she was in university, and we were looking at a Boston professor that does uh, research on MTV videos. I forget his name. He was sued by them, so I don't think he has them anymore. Uh, he used to you know, copy them and then talk about them. I mean, you're allowed to do that, but then he, he sold copies so that I could talk about it, and I guess that's when he got in trouble. But he was showing how they're made. He deconstructed them. Here's how they're made. And I remember my niece, I said, can you watch this video and tell me what you think of it? And, and this was 20 years ago, and they were tame then. And she said, well, now I understand why when my boyfriend watches, he likes to watch these things, and I never did. She did girls are not as attracted to it, you know, typically because that's not what, A, their peer group thinks is attractive. Um, and they may do it. They may watch some of the stuff because their boyfriends want them to, but it's not their thing. So, again, it's something guys can identify with. But they're made to make money, and to make money, if the kids aren't buying it, you have to tweak it. And the way you tweak it is never to take out violence, never to take out sexual stuff. Uh, it's always to increase it. And so little by little, you know, parents might go, whoa, you know, I started playing with video games when my kid was 10 so I could relate to them. And now he's 16 and I, you know, this stuff is horrible. You look up, I was going to talk to in uh, psychiatry about the use of the internet. Because how many psychiatrists are here in the room? Okay, Psych <laughs> psychiatrists didn't know anything about it how to deal with the internet and the kids. So I showed, I said, okay, pretend you had a patient, 16-year-old kid, and he's, uh, he's pissed off at the session he just went to. So he goes home, what's the first thing he does? He types in, in Google, I want to kill my, my psychiatrist. Okay, let's, let's see what happens. So I typed into Google in front of him, and what pops up? Grand Theft Auto, and a little, and the first thing that popped up was this little, really well done videotape done by someone with very severe bipolar disorder, because <laughs> he even said that at the end, telling you why you shouldn't take your meds. And it was very well done, but, uh, but it was very bizarre and scary. And then the second thing was Grand Theft Auto. How to kill your teacher, how to kill your, you know, your girlfriend, and then little video clips of how to do it. Okay? And then you type in, I want to kill myself. Okay? What pops up? Wikipedia page with pictures. Okay, what is asphyxiation? Well, here's how to do it in the picture. Unbelievable. So where do kids go today for this kind of information? Okay, they don't go to their parents or their, t their teacher. They might go to their friends, except that they want it kept quiet, because I'm really, you know, I really want to do something against my girlfriend. I look it up on Google. And that's what every killer has done. They always go back and find these pages. Lanza studied this stuff. He lived in it. And so did all the other shooters. And, um, and it's poisonous. It's toxic. So let's, let's enter a little toxin for you. Um, this was done by high school students. It was not done by me. It's not commercial. This was, we, there's a media study class that they have in Ontario that's an elective. It's grade 11 kids. And as part of media studies, they happen to look at you know, important things in the media. And they said, would you put together a montage of what you think it's, you know, of what it's like to be looking at this stuff today? So it's, some of it's exaggerated because it's a montage, but it does give you a feeling, and it's not all just violence. It's just a, a sense of, of uh, what goes on.
So, a little bit of toxin for you. Uh, the guy was still using the DSM-3R when he wrote that song, I think. No longer blame it on our ADD. Um, what did you notice? How do you feel after watching that? And I, some of you, probably more of the male gender, are thinking, hey, you know, I watch that stuff, no big deal. I understand. We, we do. It's, it isn't a big deal. It's a question of who, who's watching it and for what purpose and how often and what other messages do they get. Okay. I'm a believer that you can watch an hour of this stuff and 10 minutes of education around it will change your view of it. But if all we offer kids for entertainment and games is sex and violence, then that's what they're going to deliver. It's that straightforward. Uh, and yet we're, we sometimes feel like our arms are crossed, our hands are crossed, or tied behind our back that, you know, what are you going to do about this? Okay. You're not going to stop it. Forget that. It's not about um, blocking them in any fashion or censoring it. Uh, it is about choice. And so it's all about helping kids make right decisions about this stuff so that what happens is that the producers of it say, hey, that doesn't sell anymore. We're losing sales. We've got to come up with something better. And now there are video game master's programs out there that are building social uh, socially appropriate types of activities, and it's tough to do. I mean, they're trying to find ways, not just for commercial, but for education, that attract kids to the games, but take out the sex and violence. Not easy. Any other reactions, thoughts? Just have a minute, but hey, okay. I think y'all get my point in terms of it, the, the toxic nature of it. <clears throat> so, so this, I just want to also point out then as in relation to what we're talking about, there's no surprise that we see a sharp increase in dating violence between grades 9 and 10. Uh, this is based on our school data, but it's, you know, it's, it's not uh, uh, the be-all and end-all. It's not a, a huge sample. But in grade 9, you've got around 10% of kids reporting that they're a victim, and even fewer report that they're doing it, of course, but it's a victim. And this more than doubles by grade 10, and you notice as boys and girls are reporting it. And remember, with dating violence, uh, it, it certainly is gendered, but it's, it's not um, stratified boys against girls all the time. And the girls will be the first to tell you that they do more of it than the boys. They hit them more often. There's a real dynamic in dating violence that's quite interesting. Those of us in the field that's studying it all find the girls report more, no question about it. Um, but what they're doing is different and has different consequences. Okay. They say that they do these things because they have to get the boy's attention. He wasn't listening to me, so I kicked him. Guess where that comes from? That's how boys learn to relate. And girls are trying to learn, relate to the boys. So they do the same thing guys do. Dude, you know, punch him. And so there's no surprise with it. It has less, uh, fewer consequences, but I just wanted to mention that. Uh, we can't talk about it just as boy against girl. It's not, that's not their world. Then you get a sharp increase in binge drinking between grades 7 and 10. This is five or more drinks, and this is binge drinking in the past month, um, around 10% of grade 7, and then it jumps up to 40% um, by grade 10, and similar uh, findings here in the States. And then you get marijuana use, same pattern, and then you get the sexual activity starts off low in grade 7. We don't know what happens with these grade 8 and 9 boys who they're having sex with, but according to them, they're having, <laughs> having a lot more than the girls. <laughs> you think there's a reporting bias there? Or, or maybe they didn't know what sex was, I don't know. And then it evens off. Very interesting. So let's not kid ourselves. This stuff starts e even before grade 7, but grade 7 is the launching point, And it's the point where if you want to do any prevention, let's start there before they are cleared deeply into this stuff. And that's why uh, you saw this this morning, but the, these things travel in, in packs, alcohol use, violence, sexual behavior. Some kids do all three. But if they're doing one, they're at risk for the others or they're already doing them. And so when the kid gets in trouble because of a party, he was drinking at a party, guess what? He or she is also at risk of sexual assault or, or assaulting 
uh, and uh, and a violence, either being the victim or abuser. So these things can't be separated. They are all controlled by these relationships that they live in. Now, these risk and protector factors are all in your notes. I'm going to go through them, um, not in detail. I just want you to, I was asked to describe, okay, what do we know about ca the causes of adolescent risk behaviors, um, especially violence, but others, and what can we do about that in terms of solutions? So uh, I'm gonna, I listed them all, and I'm going to talk more about the themes than, than the individual ones. <clears throat> Let's look first at the factors that are common to violence and relationship. As I said, these things all are cut from the same cloth. And what you find in study after study, most of it has been done on delinquency and acting out conduct problems type, types of stuff, and then on alcohol use. That's where most of the literature is, but now we have it on dating violence and such. It, <clears throat> um, the distal factors, um, they have antisocial behavior when they're kids, child maltreatment, exposure, peer influences and gender role that we've talked about, deviant peer association, they hang out with bad kids, they believe, they share beliefs about violence, it's okay to do this under certain circumstances, especially um, guys have to keep, keep women in check and this kind of thing. Poor relationship models and, and lessons. So that's all what's coming from the past. And then proximal, you can't overlook the fact that what spurs it on is feelings and emotions of jealousy, anger, and hurt. This is what, of course, violence is all about. But that's what excuses it for them. I did it because I was jealous, or he made me jealous, or he did this to me. And, and I did it because I have all this background that says that's how you're supposed to do it. Um, attributions of blame and justification, right? She deserved it, he deserved it. I don't want to be picked on like that. I don't want to be a victimizer or a victim. And few perceived consequences, okay? Especially for the girls. This is why girls are doing it and reporting it more. Guys get sent to the office immediately. Girls get talked to and say, don't do that. And now the guys are saying, hey, how come she doesn't get sent to the office when she punched her boyfriend? So there's a lot of issues around that. But this is, these are the common factors in violence relationships. Now, in terms of risk factors, based on the literature, this, this all comes from um, meta-analyses and studies. For the social cultural, social, cultural, and community factors all have to do with low neighborhood attachment, organ, disorganization, crime rates, and so forth, weak public policies, media depictions of, of uh, risk behaviors like you just saw, and uh, perceived availability of desired substances, that these things are down the, on the street corner, so it's all there. So this is strong evidence in the literature. This is the cultural environment that you live in. But look at the protective factors community opportunities for pro-social involvement of youth, and community recognition for youth involvement. So study after study in the last 20 or 30 years says, yeah, we know these are all the risk factors, but it comes down to the kids that are more resilient or protected is that they have opportunities in their community and they get recognized for it. Okay, so keep that in mind. Then we look at the family risk factors. And, whoops, and again, you have Strong support for the poor family management practices, abuse and violence in the home, family history of substance use, parental attitudes favoring violence, substance use, and so forth. You know, sometimes you just got to stand up for yourself and these kind of things. Or the mom might say, you know, it's just part of, of being in a marriage. You just got to put up with this. So whatever those values are, there's plenty of evidence of that. And again, look at the protective factors in the literature. Attachment, connection, communication opportunities for pro-social involvement, recognition for pro-social involvement, um, whether the, the, the involvements may differ in the family, what they're doing, but basically the message is that the kid is meaningful, that they have value, that you like them and you're trying to, trying to involve them in important activities and you recognize them for what they're trying to do. <clears throat> School, need I say it? Same issues. We know about all these issues about poor schools, academic failure, poor opportunity, few opportunities, but school connectedness, opportunities, and recognition. Same stuff comes out of literature. I'm not making this up. It's, it always comes down to the, give the kids something to do, to involve them, and recognize the importance of what they're doing. So today you talk about um, positive youth development, pro-social youth engagement. Um, 100 years ago, 
when I think it was, uh, it wasn't Goddard, but who's the psychologist that wrote the first book on adolescence? Basically, the title said, you know, adolescent development, uh, dealing with risk and crime and um, substance use. It was all about that stuff. That's how we always looked at teens. And today we're saying, look at their positive side, what they have to offer, and they have a lot, and help them with this. Schools that give them a, a sense of connectedness, by school's a safe place, that simple statement that the kid can, is able to endorse means a lot. How do you make a school a safe place is a whole other conversation, but it's the perception that when I go to school, I, I'm safe and people care about me. They recognize what I'm trying to do and they give me opportunities to do it. It's not that difficult. And lastly, we have individual and peer factors. Lots of literature on this in terms of violence prevention and crime conduct. Rebelliousness, some of the internalizing factors, or, or sorry, the intrinsic factors, they may have, some of this has a genetic basis. Rebelliousness, favorable attitudes like their parents had. Perceived risk of drug use. Are there any risks involved? Can I get away with it? They balance that out. Interaction with antisocial peers, <coughs> sensation seeking, gang involvement, all this stuff. This is where all the research is done, by the way. All of us got tenure because we did these studies. We didn't get tenure because we did these studies. <laughs> we learned about the pathology and what's going wrong, but we haven't done enough about what to re how to reverse it because uh, that takes longer time. And look, the same, same idea of protective factors with religiosity thrown in there because they find that um, when it comes to uh, individual factors, kids that say that they have a, a belief in something larger, they have some spirituality in that, uh, keeps them from engaging in some of this. Social skills, belief in moral order. So that was a very quick overview of 30 years of research on adolescent conduct, you know, conduct types stuff and violence, but the theme, importance of this being that there are things we can do to counter it, important things, and it's based on knowledge of, of what the, they can be doing, not what's being done to them. You can't get rid of all these things, but you can boost their ability to cope with it. You should still try to get rid of some, but you can't only do that. And then we're getting close to the end, so I want to just talk about best practices the best practices then, again, based on the literature and youth programming, not just in uh, dating violence, most of it <coughs> is with substance use prevention, where a lot of it's been done, conduct problems prevention. They all come back and they say, target a range. Don't just pick one thing. You know, work on more than one thing. Work, work on the whole adolescent if possible um, because of the context in their lives. Time it pro appropriately, because you heard today about certain stages kids need certain in information. Involve their peers, schools, teachers as much as possible. Focus on skills. Adhere to the importance of relationships. Provide opportunities for assets and strengths. Increase connection to schools. Emphasize risk and harm reduction and, and the benefits of delay as opposed to abstinence and, and total uh, uninvolvement because that, it's not realistic. Recognize the gendered nature of the world and attempt to change the larger environment as much as possible. People will say we have to get rid of some of these social cultural risk factors, absolutely, but for today, it, that'll happen once these kids understand them better. They'll start reducing those in their generation. But um, the, na the gendered nature of the world is very important. You can't talk about healthy relationships without talking about gender differences and such. So again, this is, this is what's in the literature in terms of best practices. Now we took that in 2002 and developed the fourth R and uh, all I'm gonna do now is, for those of you not in the workshop, is I'll just show you what we did. Um, we said that based on the, the notion that it has to be comprehensive, if it's school-based, you have to involve not only youth, but hopefully teachers and parents as well. Um, you have to focus on more than one behavior, and gendered nature, and so forth. Uh, we developed the fourth R, and its um, its basic premise is to help youth strengthen their relationship skills to make safe and responsible choices. It's embedded in the uh, high school curriculum. It's something that's part of their health class that they're supposed to be learning, and it's done by teachers. I want everyone to get a taste of it. It's like 
you know, at least everyone has the basics of healthy relationships. They may need more, and hopefully in the future they'll be more available. But at least give them the basics. Don't expect them to not do something bad if you never taught them how to do it otherwise. Good. <clears throat> Address the common elements of risk behaviors, what we call the goals of adolescence. They're very intrigued about these concepts that we talked about today around relationships. Their goal is to fit in, right? They don't want to be abusive. They want to fit in and be popular and accepted. Um, how do they do it? So to help them with their issues. Don't impose ours on them. That's why I would never say, you know, you can't watch that stuff on TV or whatever because, unless I'm the parent, I can, but when we're teaching them, we want them to be consumers. We want them to understand what they're watching. It's all about profit here, remember? And you're laughing and enjoying it and buying it. And, you know, think for a minute what message it's sending to girls, women, or other people. Counteract pro-abuse messages from their culture on gender, race, and sexual orientation. Again, how we, how we look at others is very discriminating because that's how they learned to relate. It's very so, you know, they start off with sex. It's the simplest thing to break apart because girls and boys look differently. And lo and behold, they are different, the three-year-old learns. They really are different. And then they look at race because people have different colors on their skin, so they must be different too. And then they get into, when they're 13 and 14, they, say, they, they look at your behavior and you're not being male enough, you're probably different too. And I don't understand what that is. So these differences can all be counteracted. And the more we educate them at an early age, the more they'll be able to help one another navigate it. Emphasize the positive message of safety and harm. Prepare them and not scare them. Um, again, it's just a simple shift in how you educate kids. Bring them in to, to discuss these things and figure them out as opposed to telling them, what will happen to them if they do any of them. I'm still amazed at how many scare tactics messages are out there as if somehow that's going to miraculously stop them. You know who it stops? The kids that would never do it. <laughs> and it gives the girls a few more things to say to their boyfriends because remember it's the girl's role. The girl is the stopper. The guy is the goer. He's the pedal. She's the brake. And so um, that big balance, imbalance in relationships is, has to be shifted. The guys have to stand up and recognize uh, I'm not just cruising along trying to get as much as I possibly can in life. I too have to have a break and I too have to recognize what the road's ahead of me. Simple analogies to help them because th this stuff isn't on the radar at all. The girl wants it, I can get it. If she doesn't stop me, then, then she's saying yes. Uh, <clears throat> provide opportunities to develop their assets and build youth connections. So that's what it's all about. Uh, I think that's, yeah, that's, that's a picture of the book we did, uh, Yale University Press, where we looked at all this literature, all this stuff I presented today is in the book. We looked at all the rationale and theory behind how to reduce risk behaviors, what they are, the developmental consequences and aspects of them, and then argued for universal prevention in the schools by doing it. If you're interested in more information, it's on our website, youthrelationships.org. And uh, very shortly, we're going to be able to deliver the program uh, electronically so that schools and communities can have it more readily. Thank you very much, and I come to the end. <clears throat>